And good evening to everyone. Good to see everyone here. I'm just excited about the study. I tell you, it's winding down. I tell you, we have finished the, finishing the book of Joshua and what a powerful book it has been. A lot of information, but before it ends, there's still a lot more we can extrapolate. So I'm just excited about tonight's study. So let's just go to God and let's talk to him. Father God, we come to you this evening, just giving you thanks, honor, and praise for another day of life, health, and strength. Another day that you saw fit to bless us and keep us safe on our jobs and our homes and in our various activities. We just ask you, Heavenly Father, that as we go forth in this study tonight, that you open up our minds, that you open up our hearts to be acceptable to the words that you have on the pages, God, so that they just sear into our hearts and minds, your goodness, your truth, your love and your grace. We ask you, God, that you give us revelation knowledge so that we understand what you are saying in scripture and that we can tell people about you and who you are every day and every, every time in our life. We pray that in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So uh, before we get started, obviously, I always like to get the mind flowing. I like to get us back into study and I wanted to recap from what we had at the last time we were together. So we were looking at the 22nd and 23rd chapters of Joshua. And basically in that 22nd, there was a thing that happened in the encampments. So I want us just to look back at that recap. And it says, when the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh returned to the other side of the Jordan, what did they do? Now we remember before they went into Jericho, before they went into the promised land, there was a group of individuals or tribes that wanted to stay on the side of the Jordan. And basically, mm -hmm. they were the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, because they mm -hmm. saw that the pasture land on that side was great. They petitioned Moses. Moses talked to God. And there was an allowance. As long as they were going to uh, be prepared to fight with the other Israelites, it was okay for them to keep that land out of the land of promise on the other side of the Jordan. Mm -hmm. So now we find that Israel has proclaimed the land of promise. They can actually get, go home. So they're returning home. And on, when they return home, what did that 22nd chapter say? Does anyone recall? Is that where they built the, uh, the big altar? That's exactly, that's exactly. The scripture tells us that it was just an outrageously large piece. It was something that could be seen and that they actually, uh, you know, put everything on it. So, yes, it was a large altar. So that's exactly what they did. So I said in study and the recap question two, in using the answer to the above question, we know that they build an altar. What did the other Israelite clans and tribes accuse the Reubenites, the Gadites and the half tribe of Manassas of? And as a second follow-up, what were those tribes prepared to do? So, mm -hmm. go ahead. Excuse me. So they thought that they were uh, converting to um, idolatry, and that they that they were, it was it was an altar to uh, to a, a different god. And Correct. So, so uh, they were <laughs> they were ready to go wipe them out. <laughs> exactly. They were ready to go to war. We find that in Joshua 22nd chapter, uh, verses 11 through verses 16. We see that, yes, uh, Brother Jackson is right. They accused him of worshiping other gods. Like, how can you turn away from the God of our fathers who gave you such great land? They even brought up, you know, the uh, idolatries at Peor. And then basically they were telling them before, and before they did that, or before they start talking, they were ready to, for battle. They were ready to go to war, fight against their own kindred, kinsmen, just because of this audacious altar. So in uh, recap question three, it said, how did the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manassas defend themselves against the accusation? So remember, they accused them of worshiping a false god, but what did they say? And that one is found in uh, Joshua 22, uh, 21 through 28. So I, I recall they, uh, they explained to them what it really was, that it was something that was going to be in remembrance of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what the uh, commitment that they had made to, uh, to one God. 
and that it wasn't, you know, a uh, a step backwards. It was there for a memorial, uh, a, a uh, memory, a Rembrandt. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. No, you're very right. You're very right. <laughs> I love a Rembrandt too, right? <laughs> yes, no, you're extremely right. They wanted a memorial because remember in their mindset, they said that since we live on the other side of the Jordan, obviously they weren't going to be able to commune with those other Israelites. So they wanted it for their generations to say that we also love God. We also believe in God. We also were there and followed his tenements. So we built this to remember what he had done and what we had done in his name. So, yes. So we find out in that particular piece of scripture that it was just a big misunderstanding. You know, mm -hmm. basically they were building this as a memorial, but then they, their family, I say their kinsmen saw it and thought it was for not. But obviously it all came out in the wash. And that's why we learn a lot of things in this particular piece of scripture. Mm -hmm. One important thing is that we must talk to each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, communication. They not talk to each other. Boy, it could have turned out really bad. <laughs> yeah. And the children of Reuben and the children of Aaron called up. So now we'll go into tonight's study. And we're going to look at Joshua, uh, the 23rd chapter, uh, verses 1 through 11. I just wanted to reiterate it. I just want us to kind of read this one to get the backdrop as we go into uh, chapter 24. So if someone could please just read for us uh, Joshua 23, verses 1 through 11. Let me get this out of the way. Oh, oh don't want to do that. <laughs> do that. I was trying to make it so I could read it, and uh, I, I switched it, uh, made it smaller. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's do this. Here, okay. After a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies round them, Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the West. The Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you, just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. The reason why I wanted to bring this up, just to reiterate at the time, remember Joshua was at the end of his leadership. And it's funny how the, the text actually says that Joshua was old, but then he says, I am old. You know, he definitely reiterates that this was a, a long time in the making and he was toward the end of his life, to be honest. So basically he calls all the leaders and judges together and he wants to, in essence, give them that final appeal, that farewell address and basically kind of bringing back into memory what had happened and what had taken place and that they always should stand with the Lord and always make sure that they always are in his good graces. Basically they're saying, don't turn to the right or the left. Don't associate with other nations. Keep God first because one of you, just one of you routes a thousand because God fights with you, saying the strength of God. So be careful to always love him. Now let us go just to Joshua 12, uh, sorry, 23 verses 12 through 16. If someone wants to please read that for us. But if you turn away and ally yourselves 
with the survivors of these nations that remain among you. And if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord, your God, will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from the, this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed, but just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised, you have come to you. So he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve the other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. Mm. Again, we see how Joshua just kind of reiterates and kind of tells them, hey, you can go and do Go into your own devices. You can go and intermarry and do these things, but these yeah. things will only lead to destruction. I mean, he really wanted to be graphic. He said, there will be snares and traps, whips on your backs, and thorns in your eyes. And basically it said, this will lead to your destruction, even in the land of promise that God has given to you. Yes. Says, so these are all the things he says, don't violate it. Stay with God, be sound and be true in him. So I just wanted to, to reread that. So I know that was a part of the last lesson, but I wanted to kind of get this as we go into the, the study. So now we look to the ending chapters, chapter 24 of Joshua and it verses one through eight. So will someone please read that for us as we start getting deeper into this study? Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave J Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there and brought you out. When I brought you, when I brought your people out of Israel, uh, excuse me, out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and He put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you and took possession of their land. So we see again, Joshua assembles everybody. And basically, I, I like how it kind of shows us that th this was more of an oral tradition. And we see that he reiterates each action of the children of Israel. Remember, reading and writing wasn't at the forefront. So basically, you wanted to constantly repeat and reiterate what God had done and kind of have a litany of where it was going. He talks to, about the patriarchs. He, then he goes into them going into Egypt. And he said that them getting out of Egypt and leading into the promised land. So he walks them down what God had done for them. 
it's funny because we, as especially in the South, African Americans come from a lot of oral traditions, you know, where mm -hmm. things have been passed down. People have said these things. I liken it to some of our baking, some of the soul food. Basically, they're not written recipes, but grandma said, put this in it or a lump of sugar here. And basically it comes out absolutely perfect. So we see that in this, we have just an oral tradition. We see that Joshua is telling them about what had happened, what had taken place. And he's making sure that it stays in their mindset so they know truly what God has done. So that leads us to study question 3L, sorry. And it said, what had God done for the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? But I said, before we answer this, let us go back and look at the beginning. So I want us to look at Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. And basically this looks at that patriarch, Abram. So if someone could please just read that for us, verses uh Chapter 15 of Genesis, going from verses 1 down to verse 11. <clears throat> After this, the uh, word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to, <clears throat> excuse me, to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the uh, Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of take possession of it. But Abram, uh, but Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old among, along, excuse me, with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and but Abram drove them away. So we see where God, hello, oh, I'm sorry. I thought someone said, yeah. So we see where God actually starts to make that promise. We see where he takes Abram out. Remember, he said, I brought you out of the land of Ur, the land of the Chaldeans. Basically, you're worse than these false gods. But now I want to show you what I will do for you. And remember, he brought him outside and he said, count the stars if you can count them. And this will be your generations. And now we see in Joshua, this pretty much this fulfillment of that promise that he made to Abram. And this is that beginning of the story Joshua was telling as he gathered them together on Shechem. But also we have a little more. So will someone just please read uh, Genesis 15, continue. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, know the certain that Know for certain that uh, the 400 years you descended will be strangers in a county, a uh, country, I'm sorry, okay. not in our own, and they will be a slave and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation to serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great uh, possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and build and be buried at the good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for that sin of the Amorites has 
not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a spoken for fire pot with a blazing tough torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Oh, that the day the Lord, on that day, on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said to you descendants I give this land for the way we die for the Egyptians to the great river the Ephraimus the land of the Canaanites and Kenazim Kedematras Hittites Perizzites Riphites Amorites, Canaanites, Jesuits, no, and uh, Jebusites. Thank you so much. Yes. So we see that in this 15th chapter. Obviously, we see that God is speaking to Abraham. But then we see that after he makes him this promise about telling him that his, his descendants will be like the stars, then Abraham falls into a deep sleep and dread actually falls over him because this is actually the foretelling of what's going to happen in Egypt. He said that they're going to be in there for 400 years and they're going to be slaves. They're going to be mistreated. But then he's going to punish the nation that actually mistreated them and they're going to leave with great possessions. If remember the story of Egypt, uh, of the Israelites as they left Egypt, remember after that last great plague, the, the Egyptians were throwing their goods at them. Just get them out of here. Take everything. Just leave us. There was this plague that happened to us. So that was that great possessions piece. piece. However, he said that your generation, Abraham, you guys are going to live to a ripe old age. You won't see this, but I'm just letting you know what's going to happen. But then he also says that the sins of the Amorites, remember the lands that they were going to conquer, the lands that we learned in Joshua. Basically, they haven't reached their full measure, but when they do, obviously, you guys are going to go in and that will be the land of promise. And he pretty much outlines all of those areas of the promised land that we've been talking about in this study, basically going from the land of the Kenites all the way to the land of the Jebusites. So we see basically the roots of what we've been studying, starting with Abraham, starting in Genesis, going into these certain chapters that actually lead up to where we are in tonight's study. So let us look just a little more, and I want you to look at Genesis 17, and actually I'll do some reading. And it said, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithful and blame and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I wanted to highlight this piece where it says the whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession and your descendants after you and I will be their God. And then God said to Abram, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised including those born in your household are bought with money from a foreigner. Those who are in your, uh, those who are not your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are to be long, no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of many nations. Kings of people will come from her. So we see that in this, in this piece of uh, Genesis that he's further reiterating what, what's going to come from this man, Abram. He changed his name from, 
father of nations to father of many nations. He's Abraham now. We see that Sarah goes from Sarai to Sarah. So we see that he's preparing the way for these great descendants to come. And I, I love that piece in eight. And that's why I highlight it because it's basically at that time, he was a stranger in that land. He didn't know anyone. He didn't have any familiar ties. He didn't have any type of family in that area. But God told him that through you, you're in your, uh, your, the, your, the people that will come after you will actually have this land and this will be their land. It's almost like telling someone who moved into the U.S. saying that this area, this is going to be yours. This is where your family is going to inhabit and this is going to be the region for you. So I just see what a powerful God that could do something like that. This guy not familiar with this territory will actually be over this territory, him and his descendants. So now it gets back to study question 3L, which obviously we kind of went a ways around, but I wanted to kind of put all that meat together for you to get this answer. And it said, basically, the answer for it is that they were given the lands that God had promised their patriarch, Abraham. So we remember we saw how uh, they had uh, basically in, in Joshua said they cried to the Lord for help, but he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought you a sea to them and covered them he saw with your own eyes and what he what you did to what he did to the egyptians when you lived in the wilderness for a long time i brought you to the land of the amorites ramorites who lived east of the jordan they fought against you but i gave them into your hands i destroyed them before you and you took possession of their land so we see where all of this started where all of this now is coming to fruition it's gone for more so than just prophetic words we see that actions were taken and now we see that these people are now in the land of promise but i wanted to kind of see where the start of it was any questions about that at all all righty let's go to the next so now we're looking back into joshua looking back at joshua uh 24 24 chapter verses 10 through 16 and could someone please read that for me uh joshua 24 verses 10 through 16 When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Baal. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gerasites, the Hivites, and Jebusites, but I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also, the two Amorite kings, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped before the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors <clears throat> whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we've traveled. We see Joshua continuing what he's saying and talking to them and kind of, like I said, following that oral tradition and letting them know that historical right that brought them into the land of promise. I, I like this piece where Joshua talks about, he says that God did this for you by actually, you didn't have to plant the fields. You didn't have to plant the vineyards. 
You didn't even have to build the homes that you're residing in. All you did was go in, conquer the people, and you took over and inhabited. So these things were already set for you. You didn't have to toil over them. You didn't have to have, you know, the, the sweat of your brow by building these things. These things you just basically acquired and inherited from those who were in that land. So he continues to tell him, make sure you stay away from those false gods. Do not serve the gods of the, the people of the Euphrates, the gods of the Amorites in the land that you're in. And then he does this bold statement. And I tell you, we, we've heard it many times before where Joshua stands up and says, I know that you know about those gods on the Euphrates. I know that you know about the gods in, of the Amorites. But as far as me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And so the people heard that and they said in this instance, Far be it from us to, you know, forsake the Lord for the other gods. Basically, we know God did this for us. So we're going to follow him just as you. He protected us. You know, he kept us. So basically, in this in this instance, they're also making that same covenantal bond, just as Joshua did and proclaimed that his and his household would serve God. So that leads us to study question 4L. And yes, again, we look back at Balak and we say, what sin did Balak commit? against Israel. Well, he, he's the one that uh, had Bala, uh, uh, Balaam, Balaam. Mm -hmm. That's it, you got it, Balaam. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he actually commissioned him to go and curse Israel. Exactly, exactly. And what happened? He blessed, Balaam, Balaam blessed them instead because <laughs> God wouldn't allow him to curse him. Exactly. God stepped in and, and for what was meant for bad turned into good. He actually ended up blessing him. And not only once, he blessed them multiple times. Wow. So everything that they wanted him to do, he didn't. And that's Balak was afraid of the Israelites. Remember, he said, man, these people, they're a mighty people. We've got to get rid of these folks. So, yes, that's exactly what happened. So we're looking back at numbers, and this is basically what we're talking about. So we can always not say we just said it, but actually look what scripture said for us. And it says, then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from the Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this horde is going to lick up everything around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So ba Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who had Pether near the, near the Euphrates River in his native land. Balak said, a people has come out of, out of Egypt. They could, excuse me, uh, they cover the face of the land and, ha and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps when I will be able to defeat them, then I can drive them out of the land. For I, for I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Binian led them uh, le left, taking with them the fee for divination. Then they came to Balaam and told him what Balak had said. So basically, just as uh, Sister Hankerson was saying, basically, yeah, he was commissioned. You know, basically, he commissioned Balaam to do this cursing. And we see here in Numbers that obviously this is where they gave him the fee and the payment for him. But we know that as we had read that this actually didn't happen. He ended up blessing the children of Israel. And of course, they still remained successful. So we look back and we find out the answer for study question 4L. And it said, Balaam wanted to curse Israel. So he sent for Balaam, the diviner, to curse the children of Israel. In turn, God stepped in and everything that was meant for a curse turned into a blessing. Balaam's sin was trying to curse Israel. All right. Next, let us go to study question 5L. And it said, what choice did Joshua set before the people? What did he say to them? That's when he told them to choose who they want to serve, whether the idols from, you know, before or whether they want to serve God. Exactly, exactly. This was that bold statement that was made. Basically, you're seeing that in Joshua 24 and 14. He said, now fear the Lord and serve him with all your faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestor. Worship beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt uh, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, choose you this day who you'll serve. 
whether the gods of your ancestors or the gods of the Amorites. For me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So basically the answer is Joshua informs the God, the people to choose the Lord and renounce all other gods. So now I want us just to look, just to kind of reiterate certain things. I want us to look at Moses and the word, his words in Deuteronomy 30. Because basically we see that Joshua talks about a boldness and he talks about, hey, my household is going to serve the Lord. But let's just look and kind of compare and contrast some of the words that Moses said. Remember, Moses was the first leader of the children of Israel and Joshua being his second. So will someone please read for us uh, uh, Deuteronomy 30, beginning at the 11th, uh, 11th verse and going down to the 20th. Go ahead. I read it. Uh now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you may have to ask, well, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, nope. the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and is in your heart so you may obey it. See, see, I, I said before you today, life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away, to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing, the Jordan to enter and possess us. This day, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I wanted to bring this out just because basically we see Joshua kind of giving this same type of, you know, soliloquy to the children of Israel. But we see that the children of Israel had kind of heard this before as well. Moses in Deuteronomy had pretty much reiterated and told them to be obedient to God, to make sure that you don't go to the, you know, to the left or the right, to be making sure that you're steadfast in him. He actually said, I, I call witnesses, you know, from heaven and earth to say, hey, this is what you need to do. So I wanted to kind of bring that up as well to kind of show that the children of Israel, this wasn't new knowledge to them, but it was just constantly reiterated to them to make sure that they follow God. So just wanted to give you a little bit of a thought question for tonight. And it says, it seems that the children of Israel had been blessed and warned many times. Between Moses and Joshua, they had heard many times what would happen if they turned from God. In your life, can you recall where you were told not to do something, and unfortunately, you had to reap the benefits of your actions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> And we're all family, so it would be no judgment. <laughs> yes, 
So I, I, I'm personally, I can recall things that uh, I, my mother had told me not to do, mm -hmm. and I did, and there was a there was a consequence that um, that I had to face, oh. and it uh, it has taught me over the the years. You know, it, I used to think. Oh, I got away with this, but <laughs> but now I know that uh, there will be a consequence, even if it is eventually. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I do think that in our lives we all kind of fall in the same place where we hear sound judgment, we hear sound reason, and we, we get the understanding, but we still have in our mind what we want to do. You know what I mean? So we go yeah. and do what we want to do and take it. And as you said, unfortunately, there are consequences for those actions. As the children of Israel saw, like I said, Moses had said it, Joshua had said it. And then in the moment, in the instance of the emotional rush release, yes, that's us. We're going to follow God. But then as they strayed away, as they went away from that place, they started to go into their own mindset and do the things and intermarry and fall into that same traps that the, both of these leaders told them not to. So yeah, I think we all can relate in our life where if it were a parent, if it were a friend, or even if it were a coworker or a boss that told us, you know, hey, I don't want you to do that or do, do that, but we had a better mind to do something on our own and thus unfortunately reap the benefit of our actions i.e. the consequence. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of put it all together. So next, let us go back to Joshua uh, chapter 24 and verses 16 through 24. And remember, we're seeing how Joshua said, hey, choose you this day. So now we see kind of the answer of the people. So if you could please just read for us someone verses 16 through 24. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. It, is, it was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we travel. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Um, then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. Like you said, basically, we see that they reiterated. They said, yes, they were going to do it. No, we're not going to serve foreign gods. We're going to keep God first. We understand what you're saying. We understand the trials and the tumultuous things that can happen if we stay, if we get out of the Lord's good graces. So, yes, we today will make a, a, a an honest reply to say that we will do this. When you, like I said, you're witnesses to yourselves for what you said that Joshua, uh, Joshua said about the uh, the children of Israel. So it leads us to our studies question 6L. And it said, then what promise did the people make to Joshua? We pretty much looked at it, yeah. What promise did they make to Joshua? Hmm? Is that they were going to serve God. That is correct. Basically, <coughs> and we see it in chapter uh, 24, verses 16 uh, through 18. And it said, they promised to serve God. Yeah. Yep. All right. Next, let us look to Joshua uh, 24, verses 25 through 33. And, and it says, on that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people 
And there at Shechem, he referred to them for, uh, for a decree and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. He took a large stone and set it under the oak tree near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words of the Lord he has said to us. It is a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the, Lord, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of, the, of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and all the elders who outlived him, who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver, silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And Eleazar, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah, which has now been allotted to his son Phineas in the hill country of Ephraim. So we see that on that day, Joshua basically had reaffirmed it and made the decree. And then he did a funny thing. What, what did he do? What did, what did the scripture say that he did? put the stone up under a tree. He put a stone under a tree, but then he said the stone was going to act as a what? Witness. 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 As a witness. Now, can stones talk? Can stones move? Can stones make judgment? I mean, scripture tells me that if we don't, God will raise up stones to work them. I know that. <laughs> but this was just an inanimate object. And he was just basically using that to kind of just promote and say that, yes, you have said it. We're just going to put something here as a marker to say, on this day, at this time, this is what you agreed to. This is what you're going to be part of. So it wasn't that the rock of the stone had power. It just basically was who was using that kind of that, almost like the memoriam, like the memoriam of the great altar that was built on the other side of the Jordan so that they could remember any time they passed by that on this day, at this time, this is when they said that they were truly going to serve the Lord. But then this, we also see that Joshua does die. And basically, he's buried in that home country, you know, basically in that hometown. Remember, at the end of all the battles, he was given a certain area. Remember, mm -hmm. he was given Timothy, and that's basically where his people were, i.e. his family. So he was buried in his family's town. But then we see something very interesting. And it talks about the, jo the bones of Joseph. Now, this is something interesting, because... We haven't really discussed this in any aspect of uh, the Old Testament scriptures of Joshua, but this was a significant thing because these bones had been carried with the Israelites for a little while. So, well, let us first go to uh, our study question, then we'll get deeper. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so study question 7L, it said, what covenant was made at Shechem? That they made the covenant that they um, that they would worship only God mm -hmm. and obey Him. That is it. So basically, that's exactly what they said. We see that in verses twenty three uh, through twenty five and uh, through twenty six. Excuse me. Joshua made a covenant with Israel to serve the Lord only. So then we go next, and we pretty much kind of discussed it, where it says, what was the purpose of putting a large stone under an oak tree? What was that purpose? Why did Joshua do that? Well, like you said, it's kind of just to memorialize the uh, covenant that they made uh, to remind them that that's what they had agreed to. <laughs> Exactly. So if, if any will walk by, they can point out, say, oh, why is that rock under there? Well, this is the day that your parents said that they would worship God. So if you're going and doing your own things, you said it. <laughs> you said it. So it's kind of like that bond. So yes. And it, we see that in, in Joshua 24, 26. Uh, and it basically says uh, to act as a witness. In other words, it stood as a symbol of the agreement that they had made when they stated they would serve the Lord. So, you have your hand up? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So, I think yeah, it's uh, <laughs> how Joshua keeps uh, reminding 
reminding them, right? Because their ancestors, because of their disobedience, they had died off in the wilderness. And so it was important to remind the generation so that they, I mean, Israelites didn't have a, a, a good history of keeping their word to God, right? They, they were very cyclic, right? And, it's, oh, it, and it seems, you know, interesting to me how, you know, we look at it or I look at it and study and say, man, they should have learned their lesson, right? But then I turn around and I look at us, <laughs> look at us today, and I say, "Man, yeah. well, we should have learned. We should have learned our lesson." Exactly. I, I, I say collectively and individually because we can look right. out, but then that person that we look at when we're brushing our teeth in the morning, that that person too, <laughs> we look at it. Yeah. So you're right. You're very right. Very right. <laughs> Our, our, our pastor says the mm -hmm. problem with sin is that I in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very, very true. Very, very true. Tell him I to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> so we find out now, we said, how old was Joshua when, we, when he died and where was he buried? He was 110 years old. 110. Yes, yes. And where was he buried? In, in his inheritance land. Mm -hmm. Correct. The order of his inheritance in Timura? Mm -hmm. uh, Tim? Tim yeah. mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is correct. That is correct. So he lived to the ripe old age of 110. And remember, Joshua had seen so much. Remember, he was uh, the basically right there attached to Moses. So when Moses went up to Sinai, Joshua was with him. He didn't get to go into talking, commune with God. He was down further. And so Joshua also was part of that group of men that went out and scouted the promised land. Remember him and Caleb, they were like, hey, we can take, we can take them. I don't care how big the elephant are. We're going to fight and we're going to make sure that God is seen. So Joshua had seen so much in his 110 years, but yes, he died and they buried him in his hometown, literally. <laughs> so I wanted us to look at those bones again because it said what was done with the bones of joseph and when we speak about joseph do we recall who that is yeah okay he's one of jacob's sons right he was the one that was sold into slavery by his brothers correct correct he was the one the favorite Remember, he had that wonderful yeah. coat. And they were like, oh, look at him. He thinks he's all that and then some. So his brother uh -huh. actually wanted the plot to kill him. Right. And they put him down. They said, oh, let's just think about it. So then they went back. And, oh, they sold him to a caravan. And they forgot about their brother. But obviously, then he became wealthy in Egypt. Obviously, we know the story as it progressed. And of course, they went during a time of famine. They had to go to Egypt. Of course, of course, the world was under a big famine. They went and, of course, he sees them. He does a lot of little trickery, puts a little grain, a little cup in a bag, had some about to say, but then eventually he reveals himself to them. But we want to figure out why this was important and why they still had these bones. What did that really mean? So I'm going to go to this uh, to look at these scriptures. We're going to look at Genesis 45. And if someone could just read for us Genesis 45, we're going to start at that first verse and see the significance and why these bones were even mentioned in Joshua. Excuse me. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not 
be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of, of you. Mm -hmm. For two years now, there has been famine in the land and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. So we come here and we, we find basically kind of the ending of the story of Joseph and his brothers, where he is a great official in Egypt. And basically he gets to the point to where he can't hold himself or contain himself anymore. And he calls everyone to get out. And basically he tells his brothers who he is, but they're just astonished. Could you imagine this was decades prior? They had almost forgot about their brother, you know, in essence, they didn't, couldn't even put two and two together. So he had to even reiterate again, I'm Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. You know what I mean? And in him, he was the one sobbing. He was the one that was so just excited and happy to see his family again. So we see that piece about Joseph, but let us look at Genesis 50. And it says, and Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. We have to see that's synonymous with Joshua, 110, 110. Also, the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land of promise, a uh, land he promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid. And then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110. And after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. So now we see basically back in Genesis, Joseph had you know, revealed himself to his brothers. They lived a life in Egypt. But remember, Egypt was not the place that God had for them. Basically, remember, we're talking about a land of promise. And Joseph had the foresight to know that. And so basically, he said that when I die, I don't want to be buried in this foreign country. I want to be buried in that place that God has for us, that God has for our people. I want to be buried in the land of promise. So swear to me, these people, that you will make sure that my bones get buried in the place of promise. I, I want to rest in my in my in, in my in the place of my people in essence. So we see that this is where that covenantal agreement was made between men, obviously, so that his body would be taken uh, into the land of promise. So let us go again. And I just want someone just to read Exodus 13. Like I said, I really wanted to bring it home and I wanted just to kind of finish this together. So someone would please please read Exodus 13 verses 17 uh, through 19. And this is basically uh, where, when Moses was caretaker of the bones. Mm -hmm. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. So we, we see that that covenant was made about the bones in Genesis 50, where Joseph physically said, this is what I want you to do. And we see that Moses in leadership was still, still had possession of them. He was carrying these bones till they wound up in the land of promise. So now we can get to our final answer. 
And it says, and Joseph's bones, which the Israelite had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hammer, the father of Shechem. And this became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And to answer the question, that last question for our Joseph study was that the bone, sorry, our, our Joshua study, excuse me, is that the bones of Joseph were buried at Shechem. So we see just a lot of promises that were fulfilled and a lot of things that basically historically came into play because we see that not only did Joseph ask to be buried, we saw that Moses had to take caretaker and then Joshua finally, uh, actually his family, BR, his, we came caretakers and we see the bones finally found a resting place a place, hundred and some odd years later. Could you imagine, seriously, keeping that covenant, keeping that promise, making sure that these bones were cared for? Because they were probably bones at the time, even though he was uh, embalmed. I mean, you're talking a uh, century. <laughs> they were definitely just bones, you know, but they still kept true to their word and made sure that their patriarch was buried accordingly. Questions? It's good. It's good. Wow. Now, is, is Shechem, uh, because it says it's a tract of land that Jacob bought, that's where he buried Rebecca, right? You know what? I, I'm not sure off the top, to be honest with you. Okay. That I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I could definitely not get Rebecca. that answer for you. Mm -hmm. No, that wasn't Jason. It was Joseph's mother. Uh, but was, I can't forget which one was which. That's okay. But no, I could definitely look who else yeah, had a plot of land there. But yeah, I'm not sure off the top, to be honest. And also, I just wanted to comment, uh, because when we were talking earlier about uh, because when uh, um, Joshua was basically talking to the Israelites, when he gathered everyone together and he was going over the history, you know, everything that had happened from Abraham down and how that's that word that, uh, you know, how it, it, it's something the history is always spoke was always like spoken to. Um, the next generation or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's why God had a remnant, right, of, of people like the remnant of the ones that were in the, I mean, in the, uh, in the wilderness, mm -hmm. there was, there, there's always got to be someone to tell the yes. story, you know, correct, keep, correct. You know, because if everyone that all of the original ones died off, then there's really no one to carry that right. word. To, you know, that, that carries it on. And like I said, we see that. We see it in Joshua because he knew it. He was there. You know, we see right. it in, in Caleb. Obviously, his family were very successful because of it, because of him being bold and standing up. And then obviously, remember, that happened when he was in his 40s. And then in his 80s, he called him on the carpet and said, hey, we're here now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> remember, <laughs> you promised. Yeah. Exactly. Make sure. And then, and then his daughter, boy, she got everything. But, <laughs> but, the, but the idea is... You're, you were very right in that. There always has to be those to kind of pass it forward. You know, like I said, you can't wipe it out, wipe out everything. There has to be those. And there were, well, like I said, there were some that died, but you're right. There always is that little remnant that's there to kind of tell the story. You know what I mean? So, and to keep obviously this going, I mean, because you could have had people say, what are we doing with these old bones? And they could have left them, you know, in uh, Amorite King. But hey, they said that this was our patriarch. He, we kept, we're keeping a promise. So if it took a century, <laughs> We're going to make sure that he leaves Egypt and that he's buried with his people. In his right in the land of promise. Mm -hmm. Yes. Other yes. questions or comments? Mm -hmm. okay. Good deal. Yes. Yeah. I tell you. Well, it, it, like I said, this ends Joseph. I mean, obviously, but there are definitely some more to come. So, I mean, we've we've been through it, and the the, the big reason for for choosing this, obviously, I, I love uh, the historical books. So, I think that that's kind of would be as well. But also, I love the story of Joseph because it brings forth basically that he was taking them over into a place where the other leaders couldn't. So, obviously, there was uh, leadership for the children of Israel prior, but unfortunately. Moses couldn't do it. So Joshua, with God's help, obviously leading and guiding, brought them over. And I just liken it to where we were when we first started as far as before I'd come into uh, where we're at at four o'clock. You know, basically it was a transition in leadership. So obviously with new leaders, there are new things that can be seen. And right. obviously we see that with Joshua, there are new things, but he was able to lead, guide, and direct with God's vision 
And that's what I want to do, lead, guide, and direct with God's vision and make us successful so that we get to our land of promise and be there. So I think it just also outlines where we were and where we're going. And I think God is just making just so many awesome things happen at four o'clock. I just am just so excited about it. So I just wanted to kind of have something to kind of look at with that. So thank you guys. I appreciate you being part of the study. This doesn't end Bible study because we ended Joshua. This basically, uh, this means that, hey, there are more, like I said, there's 66. So now we're down one. Now we got 65. <laughs> so so um, what's going to happen is basically for our next study, we are going to do a New Testament book. I'm looking at the gospel, so I'm not sure where I'm going to go. So I definitely, it's either going to be Matthew or Luke, but I'm, that's what I'm looking for as far as our study. And uh, we will look at those and go from there. So what, how I really want to uh, use Bible study is an old and then a new, you know, and then till we, till we finish 66. So, hey, maybe we could be that at, at 110, finishing all of them together. <laughs> So it, you count your members in. <laughs> I appreciate it. I truly appreciate it. You guys are members in my book. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely, definitely. So I'm gonna ask Ashley, one of the ladies, will you please pray us out tonight? Either Sister Jackson or Sister Hankerson, whoever would like to, could you please pray us out tonight? Okay. <laughs> Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to come together and, and learn and study and to hopefully understand what it is that we are expected to do, to be able to follow your word. Father, we ask that you give us understanding, give us strength, give us the knowledge that we need. We ask that you continue to guide us, Father, and, and help us grow. We thank you for the many blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for the your son that suffered and died for our sins, even though we are many times not, not worthy, but we are able to get, have our salvation based on that. We thank you, Father, for keeping us safe. We thank you for our friends, our family, our health. And we just thank you for life and life everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yes, thank yes. you guys so much. I uh, just, like I said, definitely excited about what's coming forth. And we will definitely, like I said, be in a New Testament book for our next study, but definitely keep everything. Cause like I said, this is good. The one thing I learned about the word, it's nothing you want to throw away. You want to make sure that it just stays close to the heart so that you can just bring it out and remember, Hey, especially choose you for this day, who you serve. I tell you, you can't beat that. <laughs> you never can't beat that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So God bless you. You guys take care. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. And uh, we will definitely see you the next time. All right. Thanks, Good night. Pastor. Good night. You're very welcome. Good night.